suspect. And if you consider this uh, city, and if you consider the aspects of the city that we read there, no human city will ever compare to it. Burj, uh, Burj Khalifa, which is today the tallest man-made structure, would be only about one less than one third the height of this city. This city is a cuboid city. It is as wide as it is uh, as it is broad as it is high. Our minds cannot yet comprehend the architectural construction that it would be, and you can go on to read many about it. Jerusalem, the place, the original location, the city there originally is thousands of years old. Uh, it dates back probably to 4,000, 5,000 BC. And it was initially, it was the Sumerians, it is said, who settled there. But subsequently, when we look at the God's word, we see that it is King David who made this city God's city. He made it his city. The city of David is known as city of David. Which, uh, it was on Mount Zion, the area of Zion. And that's about 1000 BC. So this city has a lot of relevance when, as children of God, we look at it. This morning time, I would like to look at seven aspects and seven people groups who have been touched or who will be touched with the city. And for the basis of that, I would like to go back to reading from Psalm 48. The, word, the reference that I had taken during our time of worship. Psalm 48, if being recorded, it might not catch it, but if somebody could read Psalm 48 or 14 verses. Psalm 48, 14 verses. This is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Loving Father, as we look at this sermon, as we meditate, we pray that thou will speak to us, pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart will be acceptable in thy sight, and we will bring glory to your name and will be for the edifying of his saints. Bless thy servant, and the minister, we pray in the precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A beautiful psalm, a psalm that talks about greatness of God, and there are, we see many attributes of God's uh, characteristic that is here. But today, I just want to base on this psalm and look and put our thoughts back to the city of Jerusalem. Verse 1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of God, in the mountain of His holiness. And as that psalmist says, the sons of Korah, as they look to worship God, and we know their background, they look and say, God is greatly to be worshipped, and he is to be praised in his city. Now, when the psalm is being written, Jerusalem is not yet the city of God. It is by faith that they are writing. And as I was looking at that, the first people group that came into mind was Abraham. The one who was called Abraham living in the city of Ur in today's Iraq and living in a pagan culture, living at a time when 
idol worship was prominent, when there were a lot of temples or worship that was being given to any other God other than the living God, he gets a call. He is called and said, Abraham, step out. Go. Go to a land that I'm going to show you. The father of faith steps out and follows God. And we read in Hebrews, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. We read with what uh, thought in mind that he moved from there. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. Now, Hebrews, we know, is uh, the Hall of Faith are all those names there are those who have lived by faith. And we read about Abraham in Abraham, uh, sorry, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. For, for, or we read from verse 9. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, which builder and maker, or in the NIV it says, the, whose architect and builder is God. Imagine that. Abraham gets this call. The Bible is not there. God's word is as, not as freely available. God's children are not as, uh, or the, uh, or the social structure is not there. And yet, when he gets a call, by faith he steps out, looking for a city was architect and builder is God. Each one of us in our lives, as we lived on this earth, as we lived our lives, we were in darkness. But we were called. That call came to us one day. And by faith, faith as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, that was a gift of God that was given to us. We who were called stepped out in faith, not knowing or not knowing all of the realities of what this life of faith would be, but we heeded the call and we stepped out. And today it is a reminder to us that as Abraham was faithful to that calling and he lives in tabernacles, we too, living in this tabernacle, as the Apostle Paul says, our bodies which are a tabernacle, living at a time when we do not need to look at Dubai or Shanghai or New York, but rather looking and living, looking forward to the city, which is our eternal destination, which is our final destination, and thus not being focused on things of this world, thus not being focused on the attractions of this world, thus not being focused on amassing wealth or fame or name, but rather understanding that my life is to be lived as a life in a tabernacle, in a tent, a tent that can be removed, a tent that is temporal, not a permanent building. That is what the tabernacle there represents. That is the faith with which we have been called to step out. This morning, let us examine ourselves. Are we living a life of faith? Or has our focus changed? Are we, have we taken our eyes off that calling, that high calling, so Paul calls it and have we looked and have our eyes moved to the things of this earth, to things that are temporal, things that will pass away. That is what in verse 1 is a reminder to us. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, as it says in NIV. Our God is great. He is worthy of praise. He is, has called us to that city the city of our God in that holy mountain. We are a separated people. That is what that holy mountain reminds us. Once we were in unholy, once we were in sin, but we have been called, we have been separated so that we will live a life of holiness so that we will be able to stand in the kingdom of God. We will move on. I have seven points, so I'll just quickly move. Go uh, verse two. It says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. As I was reading that, I was reminded about the next people who, who from Adam who was called, who were chosen. That was David and the lineage of David. David in 2 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 5, verse 6 is when he 
uh, comes to the city. At that time, the Jebusites were the ones who were living in that uh, area in Zion. And he comes there and he, they challenge him. They actually mocked him and they said that you're not going to capture the city. Now, mind you, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem is well fortified. It is on a, it's not an accessible city. It has great natural defensive structures around it. Uh, so it's not easy to capture the city. And the Jebusites uh, were those who depended on that. And yet we see, and maybe we can read that. Go to 2 Samuel in chapter 5, and let's read a couple of verses. 2 Samuel chapter 5. In verse 7, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Verse 9 it says, So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. Earlier to this period, Jerusalem was known as Jerusalem. To this day, we call it Jerusalem, but actually the J is silent. Hebrew. It's Jerusalem was the, was the prior city, and David captures, he calls it my city now, the city of David, the city of Zion, the place is known as Zion, and he establishes his kingdom there. And so we have David being chosen to have, be the, uh, the, the founder of the Davidic kingdom, the line of the Davidic kingdom, and we know what that choosing resulted in, right? David was promised that from your seed would come the eternal king. From you would come, in your lineage would come one who would, is, who would be the Messiah, who would be the eternal king. And that is what the Jews from then on looked to. If Abraham was called, David was chosen. Dearly beloved, each one of us, we have been chosen. We have been chosen with a specific purpose in life. God did not save us just so that we could, uh, he, he could get us to heaven. But God saved us so that as we read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, that we have been, we are Christ's workmanship called to do good works. If good works would not save us, if none of our works could save us, after salvation, we have been called to do good works. Let us examine our life. Even as we examine if we are living a life of faith, let us examine if a life is one that is fulfilling God's purpose in my life. David was chosen by God. He established Jerusalem as a city of God's people that became the capital. His desire was that God would be worshipped in the city. His desire was that a temple would be built, a permanent worship place would be built here, because till then, the uh, God's place of worship was the tabernacle. It was a tent of meeting. But he desired that a building would be built so that in the city, so that God would be worshipped there. However, God told him, not in your time, but your son will build the city because you have shed blood. And we know that David, as we read in Samuel, we see that he prepared everything that was necessary, advised his son on all the guidance that he gave. Uh, so that the son could build this the, the temple of God, which would be the temple that would uh, that would bring glory to God, and where the Shekinah, the glory of God, would come down, and God would covenant with God's people there. We know about all this. I'm not going to read it. David's heart was towards the city. David's heart was in fulfilling what was God's purposes in our in his life. Let us examine ourselves. Is a heart set on that city, the eternal city, which is for us, a city of dwelling, or is a heart set on things that are here? Are we focused to understand why God has chosen us? Are we focused on trying to understand, God, if you have placed me here in Mumbai, what is your purpose in my life? What is it that you expect of me? Or are we just going in neutral gear? Happy to have the ticket to heaven, and yet there is no proof. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am the true vine. 
the branch, you are the branches. The branches were grafted into the true vine so that it, it is to bring fruit hundredfold in abundance as we read there in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We have been called, we have been chosen so that we have been given a purpose so that we would bear fruit. David fulfilled the purposes that God has for him. Did he have a perfect life? No. That is the beauty of God's word. Even in David, who is a man after God's own heart, we see recorded in the word of God his failures. But you know what? And I always say this, that David, and if you take Judas, and if you take Peter, they all sinned against God. But there was one difference. David repented. When his sin was shown to him, he repented, cried out terribly. Peter, when he rejected the Lord and when he understood, he repented. Judas went and hung himself. That is the difference. Dear beloved, we are weak, we are human beings, we have shortcomings, we have failures. But if we are called, and if God has chosen us for a specific purpose, then he will also give us the necessary grace to accomplish that. It is not on our strength. If we are weak, we are human beings, we cannot fulfill his divine purpose in our lives, except he gives us the grace for it. Except he gives us the necessary uh, arrangements or the circumstances where which we can uh, work. Our dependence to fulfill his purposes is back on him again. That is what the divine plan is. If we try to do it on our own, we will fail. So if we have been called in verse 1, if we have been chosen in verse 2, when you come to verse 3, it says, God is known in your palaces for a refuge. David sought the Lord for refuge only. David's many psalms talked about how he is a fortress. He is the, uh, under whose shadow he dwells and he talks about many things. But when I was reading this, God is known in her palaces. It talks about our public ministry. It talks about our testimony. It talks about a revelation to those around us to know who we are. And that the best example I could find was Daniel, a young man who purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. To purpose that whatever might be, even as a young uh, boy, a teen, taken into a foreign country, living under foreign rules, forced to be a captive in, in, a, in a strange country, he resolved in his heart that he would not defy God. What did God do? God elevated him greatly. But did, he, did his heart lift up in pride? No, he always remembered, I am a captive here. I am a stranger here. This is not my home. My home is Jerusalem. To him, it was a physical home in, uh, here in uh, Israel. And that is where his focus was. Even at the point of his life being under threat. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Uh, a very familiar portion to all of us, right? When King Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree that... For a period of time, worship was to be offered only to the idol that he had built. An idol he built out of pride because of a dream which was revealed to him saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold on, that, uh, on the idol that he had seen earlier. Probably because of that, he had built something and David had, we see over and over again, succeeded over that. Time has gone. David is, uh, sorry, not David, Daniel. Daniel is now over 80 years old. Almost 70 years have passed. And he's an old man. Kingdoms have come and gone. Rulers have come and gone. Nebuchadnezzar, who took him captive, is no more that great, powerful king. There is a different ruler that's come. And the, 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 the culture has changed. But Daniel continued to be faithful to God, Daniel continued his testimony. And what do we see when he is challenged here? When he is elevated to the position of the number one among the top three, who 
who were the head of 120 uh, governors when when those other three uh, and the 120 uh, fabricated a way for him to fail because notice one thing they said that he will not fail in anything he was not corrupt imagine he's a government official the highest order in the kingdom he's not corrupt he does his job faithfully we cannot find anything wrong with him they said in verse 5 we will never find anything any basis for charges against this man daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his god a captive in a strange country with strange customs but one who is able to publicly witness the lord in your work front in your businesses in your society are people able to testify of you in the same manner there's nothing wrong in him if we need to catch him on anything it is on his worship to god if on a sunday you have to go for work are you willing to sacrifice and say i'd rather come to a meeting i want to my priority is to worship god examine your lives Look at where you have compromised. Now I'm not talking about those who have beauty. I know if you have to fly, you have to fly. I'm not talking about those but unavoidable circumstances. But I am saying that if you have a choice, are you able to make a choice saying, boss, I will come after 12 and I will sit how long you need. But morning, I need to go for worship. Are you able to make that choice? Are you able to take a stand for the Lord? I don't believe any one of us here had as great a responsibility as did Daniel in that period of time. The kingdom of the Medes and the uh, Persians spread across a wide area. All of today, what is Middle East and all the way even up to India. 122, 120 provinces, 120 princes or governors who reported to him. How many people do we have reporting? Even if we are in leadership, 120 different cultures, different languages, different nations with different problems, different challenges. And mind you, those under him, as we see here, were not cooperative with him. They would rather that he fail. And yet, in the midst of that, he lives uh, an exemplary Christian life or a life of faith. And we see that his focus was towards the city. We read in verse 10 that as was his custom, three times a day, he would go to his chamber, open the window towards Jerusalem, and he would spend time with God. A reminder to us that God is to be known in our lives. We, in a, in a way, are captives in this land, in this time, in this place. Because we are captives to sin, we are captives to uh, the world, we are captives to Satan. It is all around us. Till our final deliverance, the deliverance from the presence of sin, sin is around us. The governments are against us. And we see that even in this country and every other country today. If there is one people group that is targeted, if there is one people group that that does not go against the government, but is targeted, it is Christians, they are, they are believers. Churches are broken down. Homes are raided. All of that is happening around us. But do we live as captives? Or are we living as those who have a vision towards the city? And are we living as ambassadors of that city? That is what Paul reminds us, right? You are ambassadors. Are we living as ambassadors? Confident of him who has called us out. Confident that he will fulfill that he, that which he has purposed in our life. Or are we living a defeated life? Do our friends, our neighbors, those around us know who we are? I need to go very quickly. If you go from chapter uh, verses 4 to 7 of chapter 48, Psalm 48, we read, we read about the people around. 
I don't have much time to go through it. But as we read, we read about the captors. So even as we are captives, the captors around us, they are celebrating, they are rejoicing. They have the upper hand. Churches are being demolished. Uh, uh, people are being beaten. God's people are being put into prison. Even now we are praying for uh, those dear brothers from Bihar who were captured or many others like that. The captors are winning. But if we go, and then, uh, since I don't have time, I'll go very quickly to it. If we go towards Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, they will come back against the city of Jerusalem, the actual city of Jerusalem. You know, today, if there is one city that comes to the news most often, if there is one city that political um, politicians talk about, if there is one city that creates the contention in the world, that is Jerusalem. A divided city, a city that is claimed by many people groups, and yet it is a city that continues to transform. A small, tiny nation of Israel, God's chosen people, have declared that this is our city. In the 1967 war, they took back Jerusalem. And even though it is today claimed that East Jerusalem is the capital of uh, uh, Palestine, this city continues to be there. And, and, and if you read God, uh, God's word, Zechariah says that Jerusalem will continue to be a, a city of contention till that day when it will be delivered. Till that day. And in, in uh, Zechariah chapter 12, we are, talking, we are reminded of that day. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19, we see the the prophetical fulfillment of that day when the king of kings and lord of lords will descend from heaven and his speech will touch Mount Olive. He will declare war against the enemies who have gathered against Israel and there will be a great bloodbath. A bloodbath so much so that the blood will rise up to the riddle of the horses. The captors rejoice today but dearly beloved we do not need to worry about it because we have promises given to us that we are victorious in Christ Jesus. We do not need to worry about the winds of opposition that are coming against us because there is great deliverance that is coming. If today, personally, we have various challenges and obstacles in life that are uh, worrisome, let me tell you, cast your burdens on the Lord and He will lead you through this because He wants to fulfill His purpose in your life. So if the captives are in fear of the captives, let me tell you, the captives do not need to fear because there is a great deliverance coming. And through whom was this deliverance fulfilled? We read that in verse 8. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of God, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Jesus Christ will come as the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords, as we said. And he will establish his kingdom for a thousand years on today's physical Jerusalem. But after that, for eternity, in this new Jerusalem that we talked about. Again, we do not have time, so I'm quickly going through it. The next people group that we see, when you look at from verse 9 to 11, it becomes very personal. There is we in it. There is us in it. It talks about if he is coming as king of kings, it is talking about the poor heirs within of the city of God. It is talking if he is a conqueror, then we, who today the world looks, are of insignificance. We will be poor heirs with him. I don't have time to read those verses, but if you go to Revelation chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 6, says that we have been called as, and he has made us kings and priests to the Father. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, uh, chapter uh, Verse 6 and 9, it talks about how we will rule with him for a thousand years. And the last people who we read in verse 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. We read in Revelation chapter 20, the last two verses, uh, 21 and 22, about the nations, the community. The community will be blessed because of this new city that is if today the world is targeting you to Jerusalem and is targeting to defeat God's purposes, when the Lord establishes the new heaven and the new earth, and when new Jerusalem, where there is no temple because God and His Son 
are on the throne, the nations, the people groups around will be blessed by this city. They, they will come there and they will drink of the water of life that flows from the city. They will also uh, partake of the leaves of the tree that, uh, that is there on the two sides of the river, which is for the healing of the nations. They will be blessed. My dearly beloved, let us go back to see how is our life being Since the time we were called, are we living a life of faith? He has chosen us for a purpose. Are we fulfilling that purpose in our life? Are we those who are living as captives on this earth? Or are we living as those who are ambassadors to the kingdom that is to come? Are we afraid of the captives around, our captors around us? Or do we understand that they are defeated and a time will come when they will be completely defeated? Are we looking to the conqueror who is coming? If he came as servant king in his first appearance for our deliverance from the punishment of sin, as we remember in worship time, he is coming again as king of kings and lord of lords to establish a physical kingdom which would be here for a millennium. Are we living as citizens of that kingdom? Are we a blessing to those around us? If they are working against us, are we a blessing to those around us? The, the song that we read and uh, we sang in the morning is a good reminder to us that all, all glory is to, in, in the third stanza, it says, all glory is to the king of the angels, all glory is to the church's king, the glory is to the king of the nations. Heaven and earth are singing praises, glory for and ever and ever to the king of glory. Let us continue to live as citizens of that eternal king, uh, city where we will live and let us live in a way that would be worthy of his name. Praise the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this blessed morning. We thank you, Lord, our neighbor with us. And we will gather in the name of thy beloved Son once again in this place as our, our back and being in the past. We thank thee, Lord, for helping us to remember thy beloved Son once again afresh. We thank thee, Lord, for the offering that was taken, the 